Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 5 and read down through verse 8. And I want to focus on something today. That I want to lay a little groundwork and then uh, get into it a little bit, and I believe it'll help us. But Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5, says, Let this mind be in you. Everybody say, This mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. From this passage today, I want to get into a subject that I want to title, High-Minded. High-Minded. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for your presence that is in this place. And we ask now that as the Word of God goes forth, that it would find uh, fertile ground in our heart, that the soil of our heart would be receptive to your word, anoint our ears to hear, to not just listen to the words, but to hear and obey. And I pray, God, that you would begin a powerful transformation in the life of each person gathered here today. We ask it in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. One more time, clap your hands to the Lord. Let's give him a little praise. You can be seated. I uh, was reading this passage in another translation, or another version, if you will, New English translation, and it had some things uh, that I thought helped uh, give more clarity to this passage that we just read. And basically, it's saying that you should have the same attitude that Christ had, who though he existed in the form of God, he did not regard this level, so to speak, as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, this passage is a pattern that is given to us. It's the blueprint. God's man, the Christ, showed us the way. God in Christ revealed to us truly how to live. He is the pattern. He said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And by fulfilling it through his lifestyle, he revealed to us what the law looks like personified, lived out. In other words, we say, oh, I'll never be perfect, but the blood of Jesus makes up for all my mistakes. Yes, that's true. But at some point, if you're following him, you and I are supposed to become a walking Bible, not because of our knowledge of the word, but because of the word being revealed through us. And so because of that, uh, Jesus gave us the pattern through his lifestyle, through how he acted, through what he said, how he lived. Jesus, being in the form of God, or how that word can better translate as being the nature of God. Because Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. That's why we can say that. But God manifest in the flesh did not come to this earth in the way that we would uh, associate a king coming onto the scene. He came discreetly. He came humbly. In the very entrance of Jesus into this world spoke of humility. The very life he lived spoke of humility. The very death he died was the most humblest of deaths a person could die for uh, the shame and the, the mockery that was cast on him. You couldn't get any lower in death than the death that Jesus died. And so everything about Jesus speaks of humility because even though he was the nature of God, he being found in fashion as a man 
taking on human nature, God taking on human nature, he humbled himself. This is the epitome of Christianity. It really is. You say you're Christian? Does everybody here today say they're Christian? Well, what does that even mean anymore, really? We're honest with ourselves. What does that mean? Um, say you're like Christ? What does that mean? I mean, in the book of Acts, the word Christian isn't even used until halfway through the book, and that's the first time it's used. It says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And uh, as you study it out, it lends itself to the fact that they were willing to forgive. Well, uh, only a humble person forgives. Jesus on the cross praying that they who uh, are doing this to him are forgiven. The man, Jesus Christ, cries out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Uh, humility, it's the epitome of Christianity. So we say we're like Christ. If we say we're Christian, we're saying we're like Christ because Christian means Christ-like. So if we're going to give ourselves that title, I would assume that means that we have to also be like Christ. And uh, one of the pandemics in Christianity, I, or at least the, the realm that I'm familiar with, and the umbrella of that title, is a lot of desire for the demonstration of the power of God. And there is an awakening to that. And, and really, anywhere you go, just about uh, any movement of Christianity, there's that desire for the power of God and the demonstration of the Spirit of God and miracles, signs, and wonders and all of that. And I believe in all of that. And uh, we, we need to see it. However, we want that part of Christ. Because Christ did miracles. We want that part. We don't want the part associated with Christ, despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows unacquainted with grief, rejected, persecuted. The part where Jesus tells his disciples, the world is going to hate you because they hate me. So we don't want that part. That's, there's no power in persecution, according to our mindset. However, to embrace all of what Jesus showed us, we have to be humble. We like Christ. If we say we're Christ-like, then that means we're humble. However, the key, or more importantly, the, the tell-all, the tell of our Christianity, and the tell of our humility is found in one word, one thing, obedience. Obedience. We read in our text, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, speaking of humility, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. So our humility and our level of humility in our Christianity is revealed through our obedience to God and his word. And you can't be obedient to God but not be obedient to his word because God and his word are the same thing. You can't separate God's word from God. This is God expressed on a page. This is God expressed in a book. And this is the only book that will reveal to us the way to be saved, the life that is more abundant, and the path that we must take in order to please God. And it all starts with humility. And if we are truly humble, that means we are obedient to God and his word. Not part of God and part of his word. 
not the chapters I like and the doctrines I agree with, not the New Testament only, but the Old Testament, because they don't contradict each other. There's a very a well-known Christian uh, pastor in uh, north, south, east, or west of the United States, and he is very well known. He comes from a lineage of well-known pastors, and he basically only preaches from the New Testament. However, the New Testament was written by men that tied in the Old Testament. And the New Testament is giving revelation and commentary and explanation of the Old Testament and saying that what we could not fulfill in the Old Testament, Jesus came and fulfilled it. And now if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And the list goes on in Hebrews. The whole book of Hebrews is tying the Old Testament and the New Testament together so that now we can see the full picture. So you got to embrace the whole book because it does not contradict each other. If we think that this book contradicts itself in ways, that simply means we need to dig a little bit deeper because when you do, you'll see the pieces of the puzzle fit together. It's just as simple as that. And so our obedience to the word of God it reveals our humility and that makes sense because, I mean, your child, you tell them to do something and they don't want to do it, that's that human pride. I'm not going to do that. Hey, I need you to go do that. No. <clears throat> Woo. Woo. The fire rises so fast and you're like, oh, now I think I get an idea of what the wrath of God is like. Oh, Child just looks you in the face and says, no, I'm not doing it. Pride. This tells us what we must do to be saved. And if we only do what we want to do, just because we think we're right doesn't mean we're right. So the key is, is to first humble ourselves. Our Christ-likeness is revealed through our obedience to the word of God. Do we obey the word do we obey our version of the word? Tough questions today because, um, you know, pat each other on the back and say Jesus loves you. But if we're not willing to obey his word, that we're saying we don't love Jesus. It doesn't do any good if the fact that Jesus loves you if you don't love him back. And Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, keep my command." Mints. He didn't say whichever one you like. He didn't say the ones that you agree with. He said, keep my commandments. And so we see this, uh, but the challenge in humbling ourselves is we have to be high-minded. Yeah. When I began to see this, my brain turned inside out too. I was like, wait a minute. High-minded, I thought we don't want to be high-minded. Well, we do. We want to be high-minded. The level of our high-mindedness determines the level of our humility. So it's not like what we're thinking in high-mindedness of arrogance. High-mindedness, we find, is uh, revealed to us in Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Paul, writing to the church, here in uh, Colossae, it says, If you then, being risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set, everyone say set. That means you do it. You have to take your will and set your mind on things above. And it's a daily thing. It's a daily exercise. It's a daily activity. Verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, 
shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. If you're in Christ, you will appear with him in glory. But this word affection in verse 2 isn't talking about our emotions in such an inconsistent way. Our emotions are inconsistent. But our mindset can control our emotions, that regardless of how we're feeling emotionally, our mindset is set. It doesn't matter how I feel, this is what I'm doing. I mean, all, what, the Winter Olympics are going on right now. I don't think that every uh, Olympic athlete wanted to get up at 3 or 4 or 2 a.m., whatever ungodly hour it was, they get up to train. You know, I don't think they wanted to do that every time, but their mind was set. They had a goal in mind. And we as the people of God, if we're Christian, should have a goal in mind. Heaven. Heaven. I'm not living for the things of this earth and whatever I have to shake off so that I can obtain that goal of heaven, I will do. No matter the cost, no matter what I feel on Monday or feel on Friday, I have a goal and my mind is set and I'm pursuing it. And so this is the mindset of a life in Christ Jesus. So our affection here means mind or mindset. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Have a mind set on things above and not on the things of the earth. But it's not seeking a higher state of consciousness. So what we have to understand is uh, Paul is not referring to some method of meditation or any religion that is associated with that. Because the source of worship through those practices is not the one true God. And, and the focus of worship is not Jesus. And, and the motivation for that is not to decrease so that he, the one true God, Jesus, may increase it. That's not the goal in those practices. So we can't just think ourselves into a higher mindset. And we can't just go through rituals and practices to obtain a higher plane of thought. No, that's not what's being said here, and that's not the way to God. So the key is to not think of yourself more highly than you ought, first and foremost, but it is to decrease so that he may increase. The words of John the baptizer in John 3. So what we have to get at is if our mind is ever going to be able to reach those things above, we have to mortify the deeds of the flesh. That's what verse 5 says in Colossians 3. Mortify, therefore, your members. Because you are dead and your life is hid in Christ, and when Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory if you're found in him. So therefore, mortify the deeds and the members of your body which are upon the earth. Mortify means to deaden or subdue. Get control of yourself, man. Get control of yourself. Mortify, deaden, subdue your members which are upon the earth. And then Paul doesn't leave it up to our own personal interpretation. He says, I'll give you some examples. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. Those are all versions of sexual immorality and impurity. It doesn't leave any of them uncovered. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In other words, what Paul's saying is those are uh, things that the members of this body uh, naturally uh, gravitate towards because we were born in our 
sins and our trespasses and born into sin. And, and so uh, that's, that's what the old man does. But if you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you've got to subdue that. And you can now through the power of the Spirit of God that filled you when you were filled with the Holy Spirit. But you, you and I have to keep in mind that we have to to subdue and deaden that part of us because the wrath of God is appointed to those things because people that do those things and don't repent are essentially looking at God and saying, no, I'm going to do what I want to do, my version of my life. And so, yes, there will come a day where the wrath of God will be poured out on the people of dis o Obedience. But remember, our humility is revealed through our obedience to God and his word. So the wrath of God is only poured out on people who refuse to obey. And by refusing to obey, they reveal they're full of pride, self-will. And so that is... The, the, the very core of it. I'll do what I want to do. So if you're trying to be like Christ out of your flesh, you'll fail. You can't just make up in your mind one day, I'm going to be like Jesus. You can't be like Jesus on your own. You can live a good moral life according to your standards. You can even live according to the principles of this word. For one example, some of the richest men in the world say one of the best practices is to give a lot of money away. Well, that principle was found here. Doesn't mean they're saved. Doesn't mean that they're following God. Some of the most liberal rich men in the world give a lot of money away. And still, they are blessed, so to speak, because principles work. One plus one equals two. Doesn't matter if you're Christian or not. It still equals two. And so principles work. And so when we live by principles, we have a guaranteed outcome. But just because we may live according to some Christ-like principles doesn't mean we're Christ-like. And so the first step in becoming Christ-like is you and I need to be born again. Because there is no hope of becoming more like Jesus until you're born again. One of the most prominent religious leaders in Jerusalem in that day, John chapter 3, comes to Jesus. I perceive that you are a man come from God because of the miracles. Nobody can do what you're doing except God be with you. Jesus says, if you want to understand and, and, and see and understand and comprehend the kingdom of God, you need to be born again. Nicodemus was essentially saying, I I'm trying to figure you out. I don't understand all this, but you have to be from God. And Jesus says, if you want to understand the things of the kingdom of God, don't try to understand them until you're born again. Because he said, verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that word see means understand or comprehend. So don't try to understand all the deep things of God until you're first born again. Don't try to become uh, the, more and more like Jesus until you're first born again. First step, born again, water and spirit baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you're given a promise that you will be filled with the Spirit of God. It happened 2,000 years ago. It's still happening today. Ask anyone around here. It is a guaranteed promise. But you can't receive a gift from God simply based on what you do. And that's the problem sometimes people have. I don't know how to do this. You receive you have to receive, and that first step in receiving is you got to understand it's nothing you can do. But then you're going to feel the Spirit of God come on you as you begin to humble yourself and say, God, I want to receive this gift. And it comes on you, and then it fills you, and it's manifested and revealed, and it still happens today. Born again of water and of the Spirit. Then after that, now, because you're spirit-filled, 
water baptized in the name of Jesus. You have been given the power, the dunamis, the ability through the infilling of the Holy Ghost to put off the new man, the old man. But you can't put off the old man out of your own ability. You can't just say, well, I'm going to change. And that's it. Repentance means change. I'm going to change. But Peter said, repent, change. But if you just stop there, you're going to go back to who you were because you never were able to walk into newness of life. That's why he said, then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, for the removal of your record of wrongdoing. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost now that you've been born again. Jesus has given you power to put off the old man and walk forward into this newness of life. Now, as Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, uh, he's writing to a church that has been born again, people that have experienced the new birth. Now he's saying, mortify, deaden, continue daily to subdue your members so that you can set your mind on things above. Somebody say amen. Do you believe this today? Amen. We continue to put off the old man and set our mind on things above. The problem is this whole thing is inverted. It's opposite of material methods. For example, Salesforce Tower. More like the sales, Salesforce Planet now. They have like several blocks and they're like just these massive structures. Salesforce City. You can see that building like I think anywhere. It's like it's above the clouds. I mean, it's like modern day Tower of Babel. It has to be. It's huge. And, uh, and, and so you see that. And that is the mindset of material things. That is the mindset of man. In order to build, you got to go up. Higher, higher, higher. But in the kingdom of God, in order to go up, you got to go lower, lower, lower. It's inverted. It's backwards. And we can't understand it Till we're born again. And as we are walking as a new creature in Christ Jesus. So as we reach for things that are lower, as Paul lists those uh, some examples of things that are lower, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, uh, covetousness, idolatry. As we reach for things that are lower, we become higher in our mind, more prideful more arrogant, more resistant to the things of God. The, the lower we get in, in the, 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 the lifestyle that is found in this world system, the more we think of ourselves. We become more prideful. But as we reach for things that are higher, the things that are above, we become lower in our mind. The more we become like Jesus, desiring who he is and what he is, and you have to reach for it because it is a mindset of things that are above. And so as you are reaching for those things, it forces you to have to become lower in your mind because the closer you get to Jesus, the more you see, I am incomplete. I am not who I thought I was. I really don't have it all together. So the higher you reach for the things that are above, the lower you get in your mind. And so in order to be high-minded, a mindset that is set on things above, you got to be willing to humble yourself and become obedient. Not according to your preferences, but according to his word. 
according to his word. The first step in reaching for things above is you have to understand God is God and I am not. He is the creator and I am the creation. I was made in his own image, but I need to be born again so that I can be transformed back into his image because without Jesus, I am nothing. Is there a church here today that believes that? Without Jesus, I am nothing. But what we have to understand as Paul continues and as I close here is in verse uh, 7, verse 6, he says, The sake of the wrath of God comes, comes to the children of disobedience in the which you walked sometime when you lived in them. We used to be the children of disobedience until we were born again and we are now a child of God and we are walking according to the word of God and the will of God and we are subduing the old man and we are embracing this new life and setting our mind on things above and, and becoming more and more humble in our mindset. Verse 8, but now you also... Put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man. In other words, every, uh, every wicked or sinful or wrong thing that Paul has mentioned from verse 5 to verse 9, he said all of those things are associated with the old man. But you have been born again. And according to what we read on Wednesday, through incorruptible seed, through the word of God, this gospel message that was preached and obedience to it, now you are a new man and you're putting off these things of the old man. And as you walk in this newness of life, you put on this new man, verse 10, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now that we've been born again, now that we are putting off things associated with that old man, uh, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, which that falls under the category of um, inappropriate conversation, gossip, backbiting, a division because of what we're speaking about one another. All of that's filthy communication, and all of that is associated with the old man. So put it all off. You have the Holy Ghost when you were filled. You have the power to do so. So now reach for things that are above, become humble in your mind, and be transformed into the image of God. Verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, here it is, humbleness of mind. Meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. Be patient with one another. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness, bond of completion. Love is the glue that holds it all together. Prideful people don't love. So it all starts with humility. It all starts with humility. And as we humble ourselves and become obedient to the word and the will of God, the fullness of it, our mindset, as we reach higher and higher, we will think of ourselves lower and lower. I must, it's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It is a desperate plea. I must decrease so that he may increase. That's what it means to be high-minded according to the things of God. The, the mindset, a mind that is on things above, high-minded. I must decrease 
so that he may increase.